Right. Well, good morning, church. Yes, we, we are back in our Christian, uh, our Christmas playlist, rather, which is Christian song, so I guess it's not a wrong thing to say, right? Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have the uh, words up on the screen here. However, if you're watching on the internet, I know the the words from the Bible text that we use is down below the video. You can check it out right there. So there's my pointing down below, okay? Anyway, uh, so we're, we're talking about uh, Christmas playlists, and I don't know if you remember, but last week uh, the message was about the shepherds and the angels appearing to the shepherds, right? And what was the song? You better remember what song we did last week? The first Noel, right, which has a lot of verses. We only went through a couple of them there. Well, here's the thing. When the God of the universe was born into the world, it was not from an ivory tower, right? Uh, for some reason, God brought Jesus into this world, and he put him in the most humble of, uh, you know, environment, a stable. Mary and Joseph had to go to a stable because there was no room in the inn. And so this week, the song that we're talking about is Away in a Manger. All right, we're going to go through that in just a minute. But let's, uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer first. And we want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for humbling yourself on our behalf and coming to earth as not a conquering king the first time, but as a humble servant of your father and showing that humility by agreeing to be born in a stable. It's just amazing, Lord, the, the love that you have for us. Help us, Lord, to always remember that love and to share that love with others as we come in contact with them through our daily lives. And as we listen to the message this morning, help us to be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, welcome back to another week, okay? Last week, like I said, we started the Christmas playlist, and uh, we're going to be doing four different Christmas songs. A uh, little hint for next week is Joy to the World. That's kind of cool. What's that? Spoiler alert. Oh, spoiler alert. Yes, my wife's saying spoiler alert. That's all right. The whole Bible is a spoiler alert. You can start from the beginning and read the last page, and you know God wins at the end. Amen? All right, so that's okay. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be, we're going to be talking about joy to the world next week. And then the week after that, another spoiler alert is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And that week we'll also show the, uh, of the other wise man film strip. All right. So we're going to cut the message a little shorter so that we can get that in. Cause I think it's about 15 minutes long or so, but, uh, it's really good. So we'll, we'll show that here. So let's jump right into this this week. We're talking about a way in a manger. All right. Uh, this is the song I want you to think thinking about as we jump in. So here we go. Let's read Luke uh, 2 7. If you have that in your Bibles there, you could read along with me. I have the uh, New American Standard Bible version. And, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Oh, I apologize. That's actually King James Version because. I think we should do the Christmas story in the King James Version, all right? And, uh, and also usually the Psalms too. So I might switch between King James and NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible. Bibles we have on the pews there are, uh, I think they're the NIV. People said, what's the best version you like? I know there's a couple people in here that just love the King James Version for everything. My favorite version is the UTA, use them all. Okay, <laughs> whichever one tells the story the best with the words that we have today in modern language, you can understand it, that's the one we're going to use. So anyway, uh, so away in a manger, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Anybody ever had to, like, you, you were going someplace, and you thought the plans were all made and set up, and you got there, and you couldn't get in? M Margarito, it's happened to you? Yeah, it's happened to me, too. Uh, uh, there's a few silly examples in my life, and I'm nothing compared to what Jesus went through and Mary and Joseph, right? But uh, Denise and I are on a, a preview movie list that they send... Uh, messages out on the internet and uh, you know, our email and it says come check out this new christian movie and tell us what you think about it 
Uh, warning, it's going to be pretty crowded, so you won't, might want to get there early, right? Well, this movie that came out, uh, was a couple years ago called The uh, Breakthrough, and it was about a boy that was skating on the ice, and he fell through the ice, and he was under the ice for like 20 minutes or so, and they thought he was going to die, and this is a true story, he actually was revived and came back, and so we went to the premiere for it back, I think it was Westwood, right? the big theater in Westwood, uh, and we thought, oh, wow, we're, we're really early. We're going to get there. No problem. We're going to see this movie. We're all dressed up nicely, you know, because if we, little hint, if you go see these previews in the movies in Hollywood here, if you wear a coat and a tie, they usually invite you to ask, ask questions and, and respond to the audience afterwards, you know, to the, to the director, because the director's usually there. They say, what did you like about it? What didn't you like about the movie, et cetera? And uh, sometimes they even pay you for doing that, so we usually do that. Anyway, so we got there, though, and this was kind of crazy because we got there early, and the line was wrapped around the theater and off down to the second. And this is a Christian movie in hedonistic Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, right? I had no idea that it was going to be this crowded. We didn't get in. You know, we, what did we wait, like two hours? Longer than, okay, we waited longer than two hours, and we still didn't get into the movie. And the movie theater was packed. It was a pretty good movie, by the way. But, uh, so we did eventually went, went and saw it at another place. And I understand a little more modern example, uh, and I didn't participate in this, but I saw it on Facebook. Somebody said that Taylor Swift broke the Internet because people were trying to get tickets for her concert, you know, and you don't go to Ticketron anymore. Any gray hairs out here remember Ticketron, right? Okay, you had to wait overnight for, the, for them to open the next day to get tickets to your favorite concert. Uh, but now you go on the internet and you get locked out because you can't get tickets. Uh, I think my daughter was able to get tickets. I don't know how she managed that. But, uh, but that's another example of not being able to do what you wanted to do. So Jesus is in Mary's womb still at this point, right? They're going to Bethlehem, and there is no room in the inn for them. Now, back then, you couldn't call ahead for reservations, right? You got there, and you hoped you could get a room. And there was no room in the inn for them. So the manager of the inn, I guess, or the owner, you know, let them have this, this cave or this stable, and that's where Jesus was born. How amazingly humble is that? Away in a manger. We have a manger, uh, you know, nativity scene up here, and the baby Jesus is shown in a manger. Usually we have a, a big wooden manger, and we can't find it this year. i got to look for it. Uh, but anyway, what is a manger? It is an animal feeding trough. Now, I think that's pretty amazing, ladies and gentlemen. The angel gave the shepherds two signs. It says, you will find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger because there was no room for them at the end. That, that, that's what the, the shepherds, oh, that's our, sorry, Luke 2.12. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Now, the swaddling clothes are basically just strips of cloth, right? Not a big deal back then. I mean, nowadays when babies are born in the hospital, you know, they're wrapped up in blankets and they're all nice and warm. But back then, you know, they use whatever they had, right? Uh, so strips of cloth, not a big deal. Most babies were born and, and, you know, after they were born, they were wrapped up that way. So, okay. But then they said, and you'll find him lying in a manger, a dirty animal feeding trough, ladies and gentlemen, the God of the universe came to us and subjected himself to lying in a place where animals go to feed. Okay, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. That's just amazing. I mean, obviously I'm not God. I'm not saying I'm even close to that, you know. But if I were, and I were going to come to earth and visit my people that I created... Man, I would have shown up in the biggest, grandest palace there was, right? Say, hey, guys, look at me, right? That's not what God did. God loves us so much. He made Jesus accessible to everybody. That's amazing. I'm way in a manger. The baby, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Way in a manger. Now, this sig the significance of this scene here does not just have repercussions for the current situation when Jesus was born, 
But I would argue that the manger points us toward Jesus' life. Jesus was constantly with the people that society cast out. That they, they, that they said, you know, uh, yeah, you know, you must have done some sin in your life because something's wrong with you. Matter of fact, that's what the blind, they said to the blind man, right? They went up to Jesus and said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, no, neither. I mean, that's not what it's about. This guy was born blind so that God's glory may be shown to you. And as a result of that, he healed him, remember? Uh, Jesus was talking to people, uh, you know, the, they, he was talking to the people, the house was full. Here's another example of people, uh, the house that is full, and they try to get somebody to Jesus who's been paralyzed from birth, four of his friends. He's laying down, he can't move, he's paralyzed, right? And the house is completely full. So what do they do? Well, they do what anybody would do. They climbed up on the roof, opened up the roof, and lowered the man down in front of Jesus. Jesus didn't say, hey, what are you doing, man? I'm preaching here. Get this guy out of here. What did he do? He stopped what he was doing. He looked at the man and said, your sins are forgiven. Now, there were Pharisees in the group there that thought to themselves, the Bible tells us, they thought to themselves, how could this guy forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what is easier to say? Is it easier to say, tick up your mat and go home? Or your sins are forgiven? You're thinking, I took the easy way out by saying my sin, your sins are forgiven because you can't see that somebody's sins are forgiven. Only God would know that, amen, right? But Jesus said, so that you may know not that you may think, may have a good idea, may feel nice about it, but that you may know the Son of God has the power to forgive sins on earth. He said to that man who was outcast, right? He had four friends, at least. And he said, pick up your mat and walk. And that's what he did. He proved that he had the power to forgive sins by doing that miracle. Matter of fact, we were talking about the miracles of Jesus in our Sunday school uh, lesson. And, and we just started the first class this week, guys. And so if you'd like to come and join us, we do that at 9 o'clock. And today's miracle was about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And it's the only miracle other than the resurrection, I believe, that is in all four uh, Gospels. Okay, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, even though Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written before, John corroborates it by saying that it was Philip that Jesus went to and said, hey, where, where can we get something for them to eat? And Philip says, oh, you know, there's like a, a thousand people. What are, you, what are you talking about? And Jesus said, well, you give them something to eat. Like, what? No way, right? But Jesus fed them. Now, can you imagine if you were in that crowd at that time? And you were like at the very end, the Bible says that they sat them down in groups of 50s and 100s. That's just 5,000 men. Doesn't talk about the women and children. And they were there and, and Jesus has five loaves of bread and two fish. Wouldn't you feel like Joseph and Mary, if you were like at the very end of this group, right? Thinking, no, oh, there's no room for us. We're not going to get to eat tonight. But you know what? God satisfied them and, and fed everybody. Amen. Well, Jesus came, he was born in a manger because there was no room at the inn. But God always has room for us. He offers the cross to us so that we too can be part of his family, amen? Look at what Philippians uh, 2, chapter 6 through 8 says, and you may want to pick up, look at it in the Bible. I don't have it here, but it says, Who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death Death on a cross. That's the God that we serve, that we love, that loves us. The God that didn't come down in all the pomp and circumstance and say, hey guys, I'm here. You know, like we look at some of the Greek mythologies and Roman mythologies when those gods, and I use gods with little quotes and little lowercase g, right? When they came to earth, they, uh, they were big and powerful and they did some amazing, crazy things, right? But... Again, that's mythology and not true. But Jesus came, he emptied himself of his powers. Now, 
He was still God, but he came to be like one of us to show us that, you know, hey, if you think that you're going through something and you think God has no idea what you're going through, no, he's already been here. He has been a human for us. He's 100% man and 100% God. That's 200%. Pastor Harvey, how does that work? I don't know, but it does. God coming as Jesus is 100% God all the time, even though he was born and laid in a manger to show us that he is available to all people. Doesn't matter what your income status is, what house you live in, what your race is, your nationality. It doesn't even matter what religion you are. Now, what do I mean by what religion you are? Okay, God is willing to accept people from other faiths once they recognize who his son is. His son being Jesus Christ. At that point, then, you've got to become a Christian. All right. I mean that. that it's just that, that's why the Christians were persecuted back in the in the early days there because you know they the Romans said hey you know uh, Caesar's a god they said we can't we can't worship Caesar not going to happen but you know at that point you know because the, the Romans were pretty they were pretty cool with everybody else they said you know you worship your god that's fine we're going to come in take over this territory keep your gods which is something most people didn't do back then but the Romans said keep your gods but still give tribute to Caesar and and look at Caesar as a god and the, the original Christians said we can't do that God is our God. That's it. Jesus Christ, right? So here's Jesus. He comes in the appearance of a man. He humbles himself. And not only that then, he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It seems that Christ not only took on the position of a slave or a servant, but in the case of the manger, even less than a slave or a servant, right? God, who is all-powerful and creator of the heaven, not only decided to enter into a broken world full of broken people like you and me, he also decided to take it a step further so that in the hum- in the, and do it so in the humblest way possible. Maybe you remember this scene later in the Gospel accounts when Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He doesn't come riding in on a steed, you know, with a, with a flag saying, I'm the al- almighty conqueror. No. How did he come in Jerusalem? on the back of a donkey, right? The symbol of peace. The Prince of Peace coming in. Right? Showing that, again, he was completely humble and did the will of his Father to, to, to prove to us that he's accessible to everybody. That's the God that we love and serve and the God that, that loves us. So we talked today a lot about humility. We've also referred to the fact that often God will choose the most likely, unlikely of people or places to include in his purposes. The manger scene includes several different people, but none perhaps more significant than those who first received the message about Christ's birth, the shepherds. Now we could certainly understand if God had decided to reveal Jesus Christ's birth first to kings or leaders in the area. Instead, God shows us once again his upside down kingdom model by by choosing to reveal Jesus first to the simple shepherds. These men were nowhere near the top of the social structure. They were tasked with watching over sheep. Now a key part of life back in this time and culture, but it was not a celebrated vocation by any means. Right? Uh, matter of fact, remember when uh, all of the sons of Jesse came in front of Samuel and, you know, and he's ready to anoint the new king? You can check this out in the Old Testament, right? And, he's, and God says, nope, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. All of Jesse's sons went in front of him and, and Samuel still was not given the, the idea by, or the, you know, the, the, the permission by the Holy Spirit to anoint any of those sons. He goes, well, don't you have any others? And they go, well, we have one more, but he's just tending the sheep. <laughs> like, yeah, just as he's just a shepherd. You don't even want him. It's David. Well, guess what God did? 
He took the lowly shepherd David and turned him into a great king of Israel, didn't he? Right? Well, that's what God does. So, you know, sheep at this time provided wool or clothing and were even offered as temple sacrifices. Shepherds often did not even own their own property. Traveling instead from place to place and living in tents, they were nomads, simple people with simple, straightforward jobs. And yet, these were the people that for some reason, God chose to make the first evangelists of the message of Christ's birth. If you've got a Bible, look at Luke 2, 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Now, upon seeing Jesus, they simply could have just kept the news to themselves, right? But they didn't do that. What does it say? They went around and told people about it. They made known about it. This reminds me of another story later on in the Gospel accounts. Not when Jesus is born, but after his crucifixion, when he's resurrected. Who did God use as the witnesses to the resurrection? Not the highest people in society, once again. Let's look at uh, Luke 24, 1 through 9. If you've got that, you could read, that with, read along with me here or there. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb preparing the spices which they had prepared or bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in gleaming clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men and be crucified and on a third day rise from the dead? And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all of these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So just as God used shepherds at the beginning of his time on earth here as Jesus, so too he uses not shepherds now, but women. Again, women had no say in society back then. It wasn't right. It's just the way it was. All right? And uh, yet, God uses the women as the eyewitnesses to the resurrection, the first eyewitnesses. The fact that the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. They saw the angels. I think that's pretty amazing, right? I mean, if you were going to write a fictional account and try to get people to believe it, you would have said, oh, King Herod came by and, you know, Jesus said, I'm not there. You know, the, the angel said, Jesus isn't there, right? But no. Why, did, why was it women that went out and proclaimed that Jesus was resurrected? Why did the gospel writers write that? Well, because it was women that saw the resurrection first. They got, you know, they, they wrote down what was true. Not necessarily would have been a good story and would have proclaim their message, but they wrote down what was true, right? So I believe the shepherds are, in a sense, meant to foreshadow the disciples whom Jesus would call to follow him and take his message to the world. Who did Jesus call? Again, he didn't call the scribes. He called the tax collectors that, you know, people didn't like because they were, they, they were cheating the people or, or so, right? Uh, he called the fishermen, Again, not people in the higher echelon of society, but in, yeah, if, if we had a caste system, they'd be the lower caste system, right? And that's who Jesus called to be his disciples. These were ordinary people with ordinary stories whom God used in extraordinary ways. And here's the amazing thing about that today, folks. I believe that this can be your story as well. Maybe you've been questioning whether God could take someone like you with your level of brokenness and sin and use you for, your ama for his amazing purposes. The answer is quite simply, yes. I, I gotta be honest with you. Uh, 31 years ago, before I met my wife, my bride who invited me to church one day, I, there's no way I would have saw myself preaching God's message. <laughs> I mean, like... And, uh, and over the years, is drawing closer to God and then, you know, getting more involved in the church. Yeah, I, I see the calling now, but back then, uh-uh. 
you know, yeah, I'm a magician. I was a magician that was working filthy, by the way, okay? You ever seen uh, magicians like the Amazing Jonathan and stuff like that? It's just, just horrible. But, but God came into my life and cleaned me up. And now I still do magic shows, but it's a fun, friendly message when I'm performing, or it's a gospel message. God can take the most ordinary things and do extraordinary things for his kingdom. And I know this because when I became a Christian and started doing the gospel shows, uh, I would go to schools and churches and I would, I would do an as assembly, but they, they called them chapels at Christian schools. They wouldn't let me preach the gospel in public schools. But back then, you know, I would go to Christian schools and do their, and do their chapels. And I, later on now, I see some of these kids that have grown up. Oh, I remember when you came to our chapel, Mr. Simpson, and, and you had that balloon cross that you used, and I've never forgot that. I'm like, wow, really? I mean, I, I forgot it, but they didn't, right? God can use you to impact other people's lives for his kingdom. Now, the thing is, though, first of all, you need to say yes to God. Right? Not always an easy thing to do. But you know what? Until you say yes to God and decide to start doing things for his kingdom, nothing good is going to happen for his kingdom in your life. Oh, there was a movie that came out a while ago called uh, The Lord of the Rings, but it was the, 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 the prequel to it, The Hobbit. Uh, and it's called uh, the, the Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Bilbo Baggins was sitting on his chair and they said, hey, we need you to come with us because we want you to sneak into the dragon's lair and, and get us in because you're small, you're a hobbit. You can get through the door. And uh, he says, no, I like my chair. I'm just going to stay here and, you know, read my books. And, uh, you know, and, and Gandalf the Grey came up to him and says, you, you know, nothing good, nothing adventurous is ever going to happen in that chair. You need to tell God, yes, God, I'm, I, can, I can do what you want me to do. I'm open to you. See, God isn't looking for people with ability. He's looking for people with availability, right? He'll give you the ability later, or maybe he won't give it to you later. And people will look at you and still and go, like they look at me and go, wow, if he could be a Christian, maybe I can too, you know? Uh, it, it's just amazing. So, God wants to be in your life, and he wants you to accept him. But how do we do this? Well, let's look at Psalm 139, 23. And I'm going to read the King James Version of it. I have both of them here, but it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and, lead, uh, uh, and, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. It's saying to search me. It's saying to test me and see if there is any offensive way in my heart. And if there is, we need to just let that go and give it to God, whether you're in this room or in the internet right now, right? And here's the best part at the end there. It says, and lead me in the way everlasting. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're all going to live forever. But it's your choice whether you're going to live with God forever or live without God forever. I think God gives us the ability to make that choice. I think God loves us so much, he won't turn us into little robots and make us decide the way he wants us to decide. He has created us with a free will. And, you know, we can go into all the whole free will thing, but I believe God has given us that free will to either choose him or accept him. And part of choosing him is saying, I'm all in. If you're a poker player, you push all your chips in and you go, I'm all in, God. All right. By the way, it's just, they're just chips, not money. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't gamble. <laughs> so I would, I would challenge you as we pray here in just a couple minutes here. We're going to close by spending some time in prayer here, a little bit of self-reflection while Miss Ava comes up and plays the piano for us for a few minutes. And I want you to, this morning, think about really saying yes to God, saying yes to Jesus. I know you were born in a manger, but now I'm, I'm offering you my heart. Come into my heart, Lord. 
Come into my heart and I will do what you want me to do for your kingdom. So let's, let's close our eyes and uh, bow our heads as we have some silent prayer here. And then we'll end it up with some uh, oral prayer after that. As Ms. Ava pl plays really nice music for us. Don't get the light on. Oh. Lord, again, we thank you for being in our lives, Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus, for bringing him into the world in the most humble way possible, a baby lying in a manger. Amazing what you did for us, Lord. Amazing that what, what you will continue to do for us in our lives. Help us, Lord, as we reflect on these, uh, this message today, that we be drawn closer to you and that we surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, since we have Miss Ava up here still, and I'm pretty sure I've blown it, and the, the Elvis version isn't up there, if you've got a blue book, turn to 224 in the hymns for the family of God. We will end with, if that isn't love, and we'll just sing it ourselves, not with Elvis's accompaniment, okay? <laughs> And maybe my bride can come up, come up and help lead this.